right. Welcome everyone to track three, breakout session four. This is the last breakout session of the day. And then after this, we have our closing keynote presentation as well. Thank you all for joining the conference today. This session is oral presentations on substance use. Our first presentation is entitled Incorporating Harm Reduction into Justice-Based 5th through 12th grade substance use education. And presenting, we have Chi Anwubu from Lurie Children's Hospital and Neil Dixit from Lurie Children's Hospital. Our next presentation will be Barriers to Evidence-Based Treatment for Opioid Use Disorder. Can Low Threshold Treatment Bridge the Gap? Our presenters for that will be Suzanne Carlberg Rasich, Assistant Professor at DePaul University, and Darielle Sherrod, an MPH candidate and graduate assistant with DePaul University. Then Suzanne is also doing a second presentation with Lydia Karch from the Chicago Recovery Alliance, and it is called, If We See It With Our Own Eyes, Then We Believe It, The Role of Drug Checking in the Lives of People Who Use Drugs. So what we'll do is we'll have all the presenters present first, and then we'll save questions to the end. If you have any questions, feel free to use the chat function and we'll try to get to everyone at the end of the session. And Neil, feel free to share your screen. Go ahead. Okay, so I will go ahead um, and introduce myself again. Um, so again, my name is Chi. I am a health educator at Lurie Children's Hospital um, and also through the AmeriCorps program and my pronouns are she, her. Um, and Neil, you can introduce yourself. Yeah, thanks Chi. Uh, my name is Neil. I use he, him pronouns and I'm also a health educator at Lurie. Um, and today we are going to be talking about um, our substance use curricula and how we incorporate um, harm reduction into that curriculum to um, so follow a justice-based model um, in our fifth to twelfth grade education sessions. Um, so some things for today, some objectives. Um, so following this session, oops. so following this session, folks will be able to um, define harm reduction if they're not familiar with it. Identify reasons to incorporate racial and political history into the stuff education um, or substance use prevention education that you do. And then also incorporate harm reduction into substance use prevention education in ways that are developmentally um, appropriate. Um, so just an overview of our curriculum. So we cover three topics that we, you know, have found and evidence has shown are most um, prevalent for youth in Illinois and in Chicago. So that is cannabis, alcohol, and then vaping. Um, when we talk about vaping, of course, there is um, THC vaping as well, but um, for that specific presentation, it's in relation to nicotine. And then looking at who we reach. So we do education um, with fifth to 12th grade. We also have done workshops with young adults, so 18 to 21. Um, and then as well, parents and caregivers, and then also um, teachers um, and school staff. And from here, I will let Neil take over. Awesome, thanks Chief. Um, so before we dive into a little bit about how we facilitate our uh, substance use prevention curricula, um, I wanna talk a little bit about what is harm reduction. So I'll just go ahead and read out this quote um, from the Drug Policy Alliance. Harm reduction stands in stark contrast to a punitive approach to problematic drug use. It is based on acknowledging the dignity and humanity of people who use drugs and bringing them into a community of care in order to minimize negative consequences and promote optimal health and social inclusion. So some things in this quote that I wanna bring our attention to um, is particularly the community of care idea. And so making sure that people are consistently um, able to access care instead of being alienated from places they can access um, potentially life-saving intervention and also like uh, support, including mental health support. 
And similarly, and on the, I think it's important to talk about what isn't harm reduction, um, because these can often be our go-to responses to substance use. Um, so things like prisons, suspensions and expulsions, um, especially for students, fines, electric monitoring, involuntary psychiatric hospitalization, and anything that's focused on coercion or punishment rather than care all fall outside of the realm of harm reduction. All of these focus on removing people from care, community, and specifically from health care. It also prevents people from making their own choices in the interest of their own health by assuming that other people know better or that we as providers know better. Um, it, also, these types of uh, interventions um, ignore and exacerbate uh, racist policy and history, and they disproportionately lead to Black folks being put into prisons. It also individuates systemic issues. So when we talk about systemic issues, we mean the ways that um, structurally uh, different systems, including the healthcare system and the legal system, have been set up um, to advantage some folks and disadvantage others. And by using things like prisons, fines, et cetera, um, we end up putting the onus for a lot of these systemic and historical problems onto individual people. Um, and then finally, uh, a lot of these things prevent reintegration into society. So especially prison sentences and felony convictions um, that can stop you from getting jobs, um, pursuing higher education and things like that. So we wanna make sure that we're continuously bringing people into this idea of community of care and not alienating them from uh, places of support. So I have another long quote on the next slide. Um, from The End of Policing by Alex Vitale. So I'll read this one too. While there is clear evidence that drug use and dealing are evenly distributed across race lines, most drug en enforcement happens in communities of color and poor white rural areas. When a white person is caught with drugs, they are much more likely to receive probation or treatment than non-white defendants. So this quote um, is saying that people using drugs and also buying and selling drugs tends to happen um, pretty equally across uh, racial identities and communities, but the ways that we police certain communities ends up leading to, uh, to the over-policing and incarceration of communities of color and low-income folks uh, historically. So certain substances, uh, in particular cocaine and cannabis, have been used to destabilize certain communities. So in this book, uh, Vitale actually goes uh, in depth about how the war on drugs have had this, uh, these impacts based on um, race. So uh, drugs being used to destabilize black communities and based on political ideology being used to destabilize what was called like the anti-war left. Um, drug policy has become incre increasingly punitive, harsh and unyielding, um, particularly during the Nixon, Reagan and Clinton presidencies. So the current way that drug policing and enforcement looks today isn't how it's always been um, and that also means it's within our power to advocate for change um, that doesn't lean on these types of uh, carceral um, punishments. And then finally uh, uh, the other reason we included this quote is when we talk about harm reduction we need to talk about racial justice. Those, those two go hand in hand. So when we talk about harm reduction with our young people in our um, various lessons that uh, she talked about earlier in the presentation. Um, we make sure that we include safer space tips or you might hear them as ground rules or brave space tips. Um, and those are just good to be able to lean on um, if the conversation gets a little derailed or sometimes like people might voice some sort of judgment in the chat, um, either in like the chat or on, on camera if we're in virtual sessions. And so having these tips that we all kind of agree on before we even start is really helpful. Um, we name racism as an organizing force in legislation and in enforcement when we talk about substance use. And we focus on the body, mind, and community. So we're not just talking about what happens if one person uses a substance in terms of their body or their mind. We also talk about um, how the legislation and uh, policing of communities in relation to substance use has had these uh, differential effects. Uh, we discuss people, uh, excuse me, we discuss reasons for both using and not using substances. Um, so that way we avoid stigmatizing one choice over the other. 
Um, ultimately, we want uh, students to feel comfortable reaching out for support, either with us in that chat or with a trusted adult in their life. Um, so we want to make sure that we're not uh, we're not showing any favoritism towards either the choice to use or not to use. Um, and then we also include refusal skills. And so when we say refusal skills, we don't mean the idea of just saying no. What we're actually getting at is the ability to respect hearing somebody else say no. So if the students are the ones offering substances and like say a friend or a peer says no, like are they equipped to hear that no and respect it? And then vice versa, are students also just comfortable um, voicing their own, uh, their own desire not to use? We also uh, try to get students to identify safe adults. So when she and I are in a space, usually we're there for an hour. Um, and we don't want students to walk away thinking like, if like that was it, that's the conversation. There's no one else for me to turn to. So uh, at the very beginning of our sessions, we ask students to think about who the adults are, whether that's family, folks in their community or in their school. Um, we also try to be pragmatic. We don't assume everybody in that space is going to say no. Um, and I think our presentations are also set up assuming some folks uh, in, our, in our spaces are already using. Um, so we discuss those potential outcomes um, and what to do, for example, in the case of an alcohol-related emergency. Like, what are the steps? Um, are there laws in place to protect you if you're drinking underage, for example? And in Illinois, there are. Um, we try to lean on current research instead of fear. So um, instead of saying something like, don't use because it's bad, which is a moralizing statement and doesn't really give a student much information why they should make a choice one way or another, um, or give them information to inform their own choice. Um, a statement like delaying use supports brain development, especially before the age of 25, lets students know that there's a scientific basis for why delaying use might be helpful um, in that their brains are still developing. Um, so that's something that we try to do in all our presentations is to lean on current research. Um, and then finally, and she'll talk more about this, um, in a few slides, we try to give students alternatives and get them thinking about alternatives to substance use. So students do uh, seem aware that a lot of people do turn to substances to deal with life challenges, stress, things like that. So we get them thinking about other ways to, um, to cope. So this next slide we have, uh, oh, sorry, so this was actually just what I, uh, what I just said. I'll leave it up for a second. Um, but the next slide uh, is a little bit about safer space tips and how we kind of set up the space when we go in to do an education session. So this one, uh, this image uh, is one of the first things that we have up in our presentation where we want to acknowledge that, especially when we're talking about substances, we all have different experiences with them. So whether that's personal or whether that's a family member or a loved one who's using. So we wanna make sure that uh, we're acknowledging that those different relationships exist and that we're not bringing a sense of judgment um, to wherever people are at or what their experiences are. We also use this slide to talk uh, about the fact that we all do have different identities and experiences and backgrounds and that's something to be celebrated. Um, and again, to bring that, um, to make sure that we're not bringing an air of, air of judgment. And then these are some of the safer space tips that we use. I won't go through all of them, um, and I think they're pretty self-explanatory. And if there are questions, um, feel free to ask at the end. Um, but the one that I will draw your attention to is the last one, the self-care one. Um, so especially, again, with these, with these topics around substance use, people might have different um, experiences with various substances. So we want to make sure that students are aware that they can and should take the time to take care of themselves while we're in, in these education sessions. So whether that means like turning off their video camera for virtual or putting their head down or coloring, they're all welcome to do that. And we also make sure to mention bio needs. So I think a lot of students are in the habit of like uh, being like, hey, I need to use the bathroom, can I do that? Or something like that. We let students know that they can just go do that. They don't need to, they don't need to let anyone know. And at this point, I'll turn it over to Chi. Thank you, Neil. Um... So in this slide, so I just want to touch on that point again that Neil mentioned about being pragmatic when we are um, talking with youth, youth about substance use. Um, so this is one of the slides we show with youth and adults as well. Um, this is from the Illinois Youth Survey um, in 2018. 
Um, so as we can see, it looks at alcohol use among youth within the past 30 days, looking at 8th, 10th, and 12th graders. Um, and although use has gone down in the last 10, 12 years or so, um, we can still see like even in 8th grade, um, you know, almost 25% of 8th graders have used alcohol in the past 30 days. And by the time youth get to um, 12th grade, about that looks around 40 percent of 12th graders have used alcohol in the past 30 days um so it's important to know that you know although not a lot of students um although most students are not using alcohol regularly um it is important from us um, so that we are coming from that harm reduction approach to acknowledge that students are using um and then you know incorporating ways that they can be more knowledgeable about their use if they decide to use again in the future um, so the next slide kind of get, gets into that a little bit in relation to alcohol. Um, so we have a little activity that we set up for them um, and we use Poll Everywhere to do it. So um, introducing the topic of, you know, what is a standard drink? Because, um, you know, alcohol poisoning can happen if we are not paying attention to that idea of a standard drink um, and letting them know that different um, alcohols, so different or drinks have different amounts of alcohol in them. So for example, a beer um, only has about 5% alcohol by volume, whereas when you get up to on the right, distilled liquors, so you know, gin, whiskey, tequila, those have about 40% um, alcohol by volume. Uh, most youth are familiar with, you know, a red solo cup. So introducing the idea that, you know, those have little lines on it that you can measure um, how much is in or how much a drink is a standard drink. So that lowest line on the bottom um, is where any distilled liquor would go, that middle line for wine and so on. Um, so the activity we do with youth then is having them guess, like giving them different drinks um, without giving them this information on the bottom here, kind of having them say like, okay, if you were to pour um, a Smirnoff or a Limerita into the solo cup, like how much is this, would a standard drink be? Um, and again, just getting them really familiar with that idea of, you know, alcohol poisoning um, can happen if, you know, people aren't measuring their drinks um, and making sure they understand this concept of, you know, alcohol by volume or like varying alcohol content. Um, looking at um, cannabis, so um, I think the most familiar um, or the most common ways that youth um, recognize as people using cannabis is via smoking it um, or, you know, using eating edibles. Um, so that brings about the question of, you know, which one is the safest one? Is one safer than the other? Um, so this is a video we show with some of our older participants. It does have a lot of science terms, um, but it kind of has some cool graphics that kind of break down, um, you know, the science behind different methods of use. Um, and we'll play that for you now. Uh, many are trying edibles for the first time as a healthier option, but with edible marijuana providing such a different experience than smoking, how does it work and is eating pot actually better for you? When you heat cannabis, you effectively change the chemical makeup of compounds within it called cannabinoids. Smoking heats it to around 800 degrees Celsius and converts THCA to delta-9 THC, which binds to receptors in your brain, making them continually fire and causing your imagination, thoughts, and perceptions to magnify. This is why every thought can feel like a significant one. And because it travels straight from your lungs into the bloodstream and to your brain, the drug works within minutes and lasts about two to three hours. But when making edibles, the weed is heated to around 150 degrees Celsius, burning less of the actual plant and minimizing carcinogens. THC is lipophilic, not water soluble, so the activated THC must be dissolved into something fatty like oil or butter. And once this substance is consumed, the onset of the high is delayed as the drug is absorbed more slowly through your gut. But this high typically lasts four to eight hours, and most report feeling more high than compared to smoking marijuana. This is because when you eat at 
edible weed, the THC is first metabolized by the liver before entering the bloodstream, and here delta-9 THC also becomes 11-OH THC, which passes the brain barrier more rapidly and is a more potent chemical. So using the same amount of marijuana, you actually get more high with edibles because it ends up creating both delta-9 THC and 11-OH THC, which is a stronger compound. And because there are more psychotropic types of cannabinoids acting on your neurons, you'll be high for longer. Of course, you also get to skip out on the toxic chemicals that smoking provides like carbon monoxide, bronchial irritants, and tumor initiators. Smoking anything means you're inhaling cancer-causing molecules, so if you can get high without smoking, it will be healthier for your lungs and body. The downside? It's much harder to control the high you'll get. Because it can take up to one to two hours to feel the full effects, and the dosage can vary significantly, modulating the effects or titrating, as it's called, is much more difficult, and as a result, you can end up a lot higher than you intended to. But unlike those who consume too much alcohol, opioids, or other drugs, you won't be suffering any serious long-term harm, toxicity, or lethal overdose if you do consume more than you intended. If you've ever wondered why marijuana gives you the munchies, check out our ASAP Thought video that Hey, thank you, Neil. Um, so just a couple of takeaways from that video. Um, so when comparing the two, we do t let youth know that, you know, with edibles, why some people may prefer using that is because you're not inhaling chemicals um, into your lungs. But the trouble with edibles that is, you know, that can be um, kind of a risk factor for some harm is that they can take longer to take effect and for people you know to get that like high feeling um so you know people may wait 15 minutes and then eat more because they're not feeling anything um so making sure you really have that you know drug knowledge of you know certain methods may take longer um to work its way in your body um and then in general um, I think with harm reduction, you know, obviously um, saying that, you know, primary prevention is, you know, the safest step. Um, so also letting youth know that, you know, if you're underage, um, the legal age in Illinois for recreational use is 21. It can be hard to determine what is in those products. Um, for example, how much THC is in those products. Um, or what other, you know, chemicals that really shouldn't be in there are in those products um, if you can't get it at a dispensary and you're just buying it, like, from a friend. Um, and then next, looking at mental health. So mental health is a big issue. We ask students um, often opening these presentations, like, why do you think youth your age use substances? Um, and often mental health is something they come up with immediately. Um, so saying things like, you know, to deal with stress, to get away from um, problems they're having at home. Um, so you can be very cognizant that, you know, people do um, use these substances as a way to um, self-medicate and cope with any um, mental health issues or trauma that they may be experiencing. Um, so just some statistics that we have here and that we share in our programming. Um, you know, so studies do show that people, for example, use cannabis to deal with stress. Um, for adolescents with ADHD, anxiety, and depression, um, there's an increased chance of alcohol and substance use. Um, so again, seeing that this idea that um, folks are using substances to cope. Um, and then um, sexual and gender minority youth are more likely to use substances due to discrimination and disparities. So youth who um, may identify as LGBTQ um, are more likely to suffer from bullying, harassment, um, as well as experience houselessness. So we do see that they are using um, substances to help cope with um, these you know, dis discrimination and disparities that they are um, living with. Um, also important to note though, um, that, you know, although sometimes people use these recreationally for um, stress and even can have doctors prescribe these medications for stress, um, cannabis, for example, for certain mental health conditions, um, it's important to remember that, that cannabis has been linked to adverse mental health effects um, so, for example, high THC content can be linked to different types of anxiety. Um, and then lastly, when looking at mental health, 
Um, just encouraging you. So if they or someone in their life has been turning a lot to substances to cope with their stress, like what are other things we can incorporate um, so we're not turning to substances every time? So these are some things that we say, um, you know, meditation, um, we have them do a little breathing activity during the presentation as well that lasts for about three minutes. Um, you know, running, yoga, and we also have them come up with the list as well. Um, and usually they are able to say, you know, very, come up with very good strategies themselves. Um, we hear like punching pillows a lot. Um, we just like to remind them, you know, pillows are fine, just not people. Um, so, you know, bringing this up this idea to help them find alternative strategies, like Neil mentioned earlier, for stress relief. Um, and then also reiterating if they find other strategies are not working, then it's time to tune in to that um, adult they identified as their safe adult. Um, and then looking at some student thoughts, I'll go over this quickly. So just some um, student thoughts and questions that we get. Um, so for example, questions we usually do try to answer those with um, evidence-based answers that we have found um, when talking, you know, with our clinical staff and also when, um, you know, doing the research to make these presentations. Um, you know, if there's any judgment, sometimes students will say in the chat, like, oh, I've used this substance before. Um, and sometimes there can be judgment from peers, like peers saying, why would you do that? So again, that's when it's a good idea to refer back to those brace brave space tips. Um, again, because the idea of shame and judgment is not a part of harm reduction, so we really want to make sure um, that we are not judging youth and just get them in the habit of not judging each other. Um, and then lastly, I'll just skip down to the bottom. Sometimes we get questions of, you know, what is addiction? What is alcoholism? Um, and letting them know that addiction is a, you know, medical condition and folks who are suffering um, or dealing with addictions are not, you know, bad people. Again, we really don't try not to moralize things. Um, and folks who are dealing with um, substance, substance use disorders are deserving of empathy and support. Um, so moving quickly towards the end, so evaluating our curriculum. Um, so to create these, this curriculum, we use the CDC's National Health Education Standards, um, and then Chicago Public Schools, or CPS, also has um, a healthy CPS initiative, and those guidelines are the same as the CDC's. Um, and then we also have created evaluations for a post and pre-workshop um, that we um, have approved by, that are approved by the IRB. Um, so the next slide just shows some of them. I won't read through all of these, but just for example, the first standard, these are from the CDC. Um, you know, students will comprehend concepts related to health promotion and disease prevention to enhance health. Um, you know, standard five, students will demonstrate the ability to use decision skills to enhance health. So these are all topics that we cover in each of the lessons. Um, and on the right side, you can see in our evaluations, for example, for alcohol, um, our, that workshop, we have a Linkert scale that we use at the top just to gain um, a level of knowledge attainment. Like, you know, did they learn where they can get more information about alcohol? Do they, did they learn um, and take in like how to respond in an emergency to an alcohol-related poisoning? Um, and then also some questions at the body at the bottom to test their um, retainment of that knowledge as well. Um, in closing, just some virtual tips. Um, so it's good, or tips in general, um, focus on our end goal, um, which is student knowledge, safety, um, above all else, and just willingness for them to seek um, support um, and you know, be able to have that safe adult in their life. Don't panic if a student discloses. Um, again, emphasizing non-judgment and connection to care. Um, we always love when the teachers in the room participate um, in the sessions and kind of engage with the students. Um, using multiple modes of engagement, including anonymous ones. So like I mentioned before, we use Poll Everywhere um, for some things. Um, Poll Everywhere is really awesome with anonymous questions. Um, we tend to use that with the older students, um, you know, eighth grade and up. 
and then also games. Um, so we have some activities that we do. We typically use Kahoot in most of our presentations. A lot of the youth like that as well. Um, and then we just have a quick recap at the end of what we talked about. Um, you know, so discussing systemic racism, focusing on community of care instead of punishment, um, discussing safer space tips when working with youth, emphasizing knowledge as being really important about how these substances um, affect our bodies, um, no judgment, and then um, remembering that those tips to keep in mind. Okay, and that is all from us. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much to Chi and Neil for that great presentation. And now we'll move from the youth space to working with adults. Um, and I'll turn it over to Suzanne and Darielle. Can you all see that well enough, I hope? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so thank you everybody for joining us this afternoon. I know people probably have their eyes on their phone as well because of the election. So, um, so I can uh, appreciate the, the many distractions we have going on. Um, I want to acknowledge that I have another author who was not presenting today, but actually is here, and that's Dr. Elizabeth Salisbury Afshar, um, who may or may not have her camera on, so she can wave hello. Doesn't look like it. Um, oh, there she is. <laughs> okay. So uh, Elizabeth may chime in um, whenever she wants. Uh, she is in clinic today, so we didn't know if that was possible but I'm happy to have her here. So we're actually here talking about a study that we did looking at barriers to evidence-based treatment for OUD and the potential for low threshold treatment to bridge the gap, some of the gaps that we see. So just to set the stage, and I'm sure everybody's uh, familiar that drug overdose in the US has been rising for years and years and years, and that uh, we reached a peak and then it seemed like we might be making some gains with lots of strategies with overdose, but the pandemic appears to be sending things in an upward direction again um, in many spaces in the US and certainly in Chicago. So we're, you know, to, to also give some context, we actually have more opioid overdoses in the city of Chicago than we do um, gun fatalities. So when we're thinking about how important this issue is to address uh, in our city. It's, it's really, really critical. And we, like many health issues, see our highest rates in communities that have less resources, that are primarily communities of color. This is definitely a health equity issue, so it's really well placed thinking about this, you know, when we um, talk about this being a conference that is situated in, in health equity and social justice. This to me is very much an equity issue. We see our highest rates of death in, in communities that have uh, high economic hardship. And one of the strategies that people may not realize actually works for reducing death from opioid overdose is opioid agonist treatments like methadone and buprenorphine or suboxone. Um, and this was a very large study that actually looked at um, opioid overdose deaths among people who took various medication-based treatments for opioid use disorder. And both uh, the patients in, in who were receiving methadone and the patients who were receiving buprenorphine had reductions, uh, nice reductions in opioid OD deaths. Um, and also reductions in death for any reason, all-cause all mortality. Uh, no association was found between the other medication, naltrexone, um, and mortality rates. And we often see, I, I have another reference here at the bottom of the screen that's talking about um, patients who have counseling-based uh, treatments or um, 
psychological treatments for opioid use disorder often experience higher rates of OD. And I think typically when we think about this, we would wonder why, and it's because of brief interruptions in use, um, periods of abstinence, and then if people resume use, that risk for overdose is higher. Elizabeth, do you, do you wanna jump in? You're more than welcome to, if you wanna discuss how these work, uh, since Elizabeth actually prescribes them. I'm looking to see if she's still here. She is still here, but she might be on the phone or something. Um, so I'll just talk about them. So how, how do these medications work in the brain? Um, the agonist medicate, the agonist and partial agonist medications um, activate the opioid receptors, whereas naltrexone, that medication that I mentioned, that's not providing the same benefit for opioid overdose mortality blocks the effects of opioids. Um, and so often when people take that, they might be trying to use to get over that blockade. Um, whereas if those um, receptors are activated and satisfied, that desire to use something on top of that is gonna be far less. And so with both of these medications, we see a host of incredibly positive outcomes in terms of what you would like for treatment outcomes. And, and so really when we're thinking about this, looking at the, the available wealth of literature, agonist therapies are the most effective treatment for opioid use disorder. And this is just a, a, a list of those three and how they're taken. Um, certainly most of the folks on the call will have at least heard of methadone and possibly buprenorphine or suboxone. Um, naltrexone is a, a newer medication and again is the one that works very differently as an antagonist. So when Elizabeth and I and other partners started working on this project, one thing we were really interested in was thinking about barriers to accessing and maintaining this kind of treatment, agonist treatment in particular, um, despite all of our efforts to expand things and to try to increase people, uh, you know, provider limits on the number of patients you could have taking buprenorphine and other things. And we knew that there were some gaps in the literature. Um, the first gap is that there's very little information on the patient perspective on treatment for opioid use disorder. Um, there is very little information about the receptiveness of people who use opioids to low threshold treatment models, you know, low barrier treatment models. And that's not actually that surprising because there aren't that many, um, you know, when you look at what's available for this type of treatment, there aren't very many low threshold treatment models out there. And even fewer studies are demonstrating the purposeful inclusion of people who use drugs to inform the services and to make the services better for the people that are using them. So we actually sought to elicit those perspectives, to partner with the Chicago Recovery Alliance, to talk to people who were coming in and using outreach services, and to ask them in-depth questions to try to understand their needs, um, to try to inform efforts to improve, you know, access to treatment, retention in treatment, um, to think about what it might look like to do low barrier or low threshold treatment, and to see if people were even interested in that. So we recruited people who were currently using opioids um, from the Chicago Recovery Alliance in outreach. Over 80% of the sample, the sample was 40 people, were age 45 to 64, which is the group at the greatest risk of fatal overdose in the city of Chicago. Over 60% were male and more than 75% were people of color. And again, if we look at our mortality statistics, people who are dying most consistently um, from opioid overdose are um, African Americans age 45 to 64. And the majority of the sample included individuals who've had prior experience with substance use treatment and often many episodes of substance use treatment but had resumed use after that treatment. We did semi-structured individual interviews. We, I, I can save a lot of the research details in case it's not that interesting, but basically we taped these interviews. We had them transcribed and verified them. Um, a couple of people coded them looking for common concepts. And then we looked at the coded data um, for themes. So I'm gonna share a bit of those themes with you. 
The first was that uh, one quarter of participants in, in the group that we recruited actually talked about wanting or needing treatment or being interested in going, feeling motivated to go to treatment, um, while others talked primarily about the internal struggle, sometimes wanting to go, sometimes not wanting to go, sometimes wanting to go and not being able to go. And so I'm going to share quotes throughout because I think it's better that you hear these themes, you know, mirrored through the voices of the participants. So do I want to go or do I not want to go or do I want to continue to do what I'm doing? Uh, readiness was uh, understood as a necessary component for success. So many times when people were struggling with whether or not they wanted to go or they didn't want to go, it was because they weren't having the sense of feeling ready for treatment. I'd be willing to do it. It's just, you know, you can't do it until you're really ready. Um, it's a bunch of things all tied together. And if you don't have all of them tied together perfectly, the treatment ain't going to work. And the issue of readiness was often tied to that anticipation that a person would have to be ready for abstinence and they didn't yet feel ready for abstinence. When asked about their preferred treatment types, either that they had used or that they would be interested in trying and had not yet used, 60% um, of participants chose opioid agonist therapy. And they chose that, the reasons that they said that they chose this option versus others is that they felt that it would be both safe and effective, or safe or effective. A minority of participants, uh, less than 5%, had any interest in naltrexone. And then the second most prominent choice after opioid agonist therapy was inpatient treatment. So there was a lot of discussion of inpatient treatment, um, followed by smaller percentages of things like mental health treatment, 12-step, or outpatient. So I want, I, I want to spend just a few minutes talking about the number of barriers that came up. So what, when people talked about not going to treatment, what were the things that, that were really primary barriers for them? Um, the first was wait lists. So really the sense of frustration, I'm ready to go, I want to go, I'm ready to go to treatment, and yet you can't admit me into treatment because you have no space for me. And so this was really something that people repeated over and over again and felt was incredibly frustrating in that if they're ready to, to have treatment for their opioid use disorder um, and they had no way to fulfill that treatment. So one, one quote here, they didn't have any beds, keep coming back, keep coming back, I'm going to listen and you know, it was discouraging and I never went back. And so we heard a lot of the same kinds of stories around if you're getting this message of um, we don't have space for you, it's hard to have a desire to go back and try that again. The second uh, barrier that people mentioned was lack of insurance. And because our insurance is tied to employment and so many of the folks um, who have long opioid use histories have um, criminal backgrounds have been arrested for use or other um, or other small crimes. They they often felt they couldn't achieve the type of job that they needed to achieve in order to have insurance, in order to have the capacity to go to treatment. They talked about being in the window where they weren't um, able to use Medicaid anymore because they were making just over that threshold. Um, and they also talked about things like insurance limits. So my insurance limit will pay for some, but won't pay for enough treatment and what I actually need to get over my opioid use disorder. Transportation was a big one. And uh, many times when people were talking about transportation, they were referring to the barriers specific to methadone treatment where people have to go daily and how complicated that is when you don't have a reliable form of transportation. So that barrier of having to get up to go at the same time and, and to access the clinic was one that uh, emerged over and over again. Um, and that it takes quite a long time to get to this point where you have um, you know, a take home that would alleviate some of that travel burden for, the, you know, for smaller amounts of time. <laughs> 
And people also talked about once you're in that treatment system, what can be incredibly complicated is that you walk in the door and you are met with a barrage of very invasive questions and questions that sometimes seem that they're designed to uh, do that same thing that they talked about in the beginning, which is turn you away from treatment. So you see that very much in the second quote here. Um, they screen you a little too hard. I noticed where it's happened to me a couple of times. Well, they'll, you know, just flat out lie to you and be like, yeah, you don't have any heroin in your system. They screen it too much where they, I guess they don't want to, they judge whether you're trying to get clean and maybe they think you're just trying to go there for relaxation for a few days. But if you're homeless and you're a drug addict and you sleep on concrete every night, yeah, you should be able to go, want to go and detox for a couple of days. And so the methadone specific barriers in particular came up uh, quite a bit um, and, and not just about the transportation or the intake process, but also sometimes the pressures to come off methadone very quickly that people felt um, that were disincentives to continue uh, trying to use methadone as a treatment form. When asked about whether or not low threshold or low barrier treatment would be of interest, 80% of participants in the study were receptive to the idea. And their recommendations were that, oh yes, and that would be lovely, but I would like to have that somewhere here where I already feel like I have this relationship of trust. Um, so you see that in the quotes here, uh, where people may have had past experiences in the medical care system where they haven't, where they've either felt stigma or they really haven't felt like they've been in, in, in an environment with, uh, you know, trust or lack of judgment. And they do feel that in the harm reduction program. And so the idea of being able to also receive treatment there was quite compelling um, and attractive to participants. And they also talked about this kind of model, like the outreach van, the, you know, a harm reduction outreach van delivering treatment, um, being a way to cut down on a lot of those barriers that they mentioned earlier in their interviews. So things like, um, you know, the transportation issue. Because outreach vans go directly into communities where people, um, high rates of people are using drugs, this alleviates the, you know, the concern that people are going to have to travel elsewhere to receive treatment. And so they, they talked about that and that was, um, that was, you know, really nice to see this idea of, yes, bringing services to the community makes a lot of sense. Um, and there are barriers sometimes to starting new methadone programs in communities, even when we're, even where they're needed. So this is definitely not surprising to see in the participant data. But it also, you could see participants reflecting on, wow, that would actually be great because you could potentially, like in this third quote, cut down death from overdoses because you'd be able to um, immediately access treatment instead of having this gap or this um, hurdle to go over in order to access what you need. They did have some concerns about low barrier or low threshold treatment in outreach and particularly in affiliated with the harm reduction program. They were concerned that people might put pressure on outreach workers um, to be admitted immediately, um, which they also talked about as a benefit. So just, to, but it's perhaps this represents some of the trust that the program feels that they feel with the program in the sense that they also want to protect people who work in that program from feeling pressure from someone else. Um, they were concerned that the neighborhood would have opposition and they were concerned that outreach programs are already strapped, can't function on a daily basis in every community. And so would they actually be able to do things like deliver methadone in its current delivery expectations but through an outreach vehicle, that there would have to be um, not just, uh, you know, more funding and more ability to be in each community every day, but also a bit more space uh, to be able to run such a program. So one solution that came up quite a bit, 35 of the 40, uh, sorry, 35% of the participants talked about having 
these services in a separate space um, so that you would have space just for things like methadone or buprenorphine without taking the space that is being used for other purposes. Um, and also providing some protection from staff, you know, and by having this special outreach vehicle that was completely dedicated to treatment. And then they also mentioned the importance of, well, you'd want to have both medical staff um, and you would want to have both types of medication because some people do well with one um, and some people do well with another. And so options are really important. So I wanted to think about what are some of the take home messages from this study that I think we can put into practice. Um, one is to, for all of us, both on a research basis and in, in planning types of services to think about whether or not we're engaging people who use drugs in efforts to improve their own health. So as we think about planning a low threshold treatment program, um, gathering, you know, purposely gathering that uh, feedback from people to be able to set up services in a way that works for them and that meets their needs is really critical. And we talk about this a lot in public health, but we often have advisory boards um, that, uh, you know, have one or maybe two people who represent the population that we serve and the rest are our service delivery folks. And that's the wrong ratio. We should really be thinking about um, having a much broader representation in our group. The second is that the barriers are very clear and they persist despite our efforts to try to expand access to treatment. And so we all need to be doing good advocacy, engaging with systems, um, filling roles on committees, um, advocating for shifts in the way that we do things to expand access um, to insurance, to expand access to treatment, to address concerns by neighborhoods and setting up additional treatment programs. Um, to fund things that work, et cetera. Um, informing elected officials is one of those things that we need to do a much better job of and uh, bringing stories to that table. And then talking to interested patients or clients about the role of methadone or buprenorphine because the, the evidence base is so significant, um, not just for the, the usual outcomes that you would see from treatment, but also for this issue of opioid overdose mortality risk reduction. And this is my acknowledgement or thank you slide for the research participants being part of the group and for Ortho S. Sprague Foundation who funded the research and for my lovely partners, even though one of my partners is being really, really quiet. She's still there, she is. Okay, so, um, and a crew of folks from Loyola who helped with collecting data and doing an amazing lit review that informed this project and for my fabulous MPH research assistants, Abby and Darielle, who worked on this project. Um, and I wanted to see if Elizabeth wanted to add anything. Elizabeth? I know she said her audio was messing up, so I don't know if it's- Oh, there. did she? Yeah. Yeah, she said she thinks she's blocked from talking. Oh, okay. Well, okay, no problem. Well, if you have questions that you, if anyone has questions that they feel a prescriber would be really helpful in answering as it relates to this study, um, please feel free to give me those and I, I will convey them to Elizabeth if that's helpful. She said you did a great job. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you could see the comments. Where's the chat? Oh, here it is. Okay, I'm gonna stop my share. Okay, great. So that's the other thing. You can chat uh, with Elizabeth if you have uh, questions that you'd really like a prescriber to answer. Feel free. All right. Thank you so much for that great presentation, Suzanne. And cue up your next one with Lydia. Lydia is actually going to start this one. So I'll let her. I'll let her start. <laughs> 
All right. Is it showing up for everyone? Okay. So I am going to kick off the beginning of this presentation. I'm going to largely be giving an overview of the drug checking program. Um, and then Suzanne will be sharing the results of interviews with people who participated in the program. So we wanted you to have an idea of what they're talking about for a lot of that and kind of what their experience would have been. Uh oh, that didn't work. Okay, there we go. So some background on the program. Um, one of the reasons this program was in Chicago is because of the sharp increase in fentanyl and heroin overdose death rates. This is data from up through 2017. Uh, more recent data has showed a continuing increase. And so there was a, a large concern, especially with the relative rates versus like an opioid pain reliever, that there needed to be a better understanding of what was in the illicit drug market to try and understand why these overdose rates were climbing kind of so quickly. Um, and then another thing that's unique to the Chicago market is, or not so much the market as what's going on with overdose death rates in Chicago is that there's very large racial disparities that kind of run counter to what can often be the national narrative. So in Chicago, the highest overdose death rates are among non-Hispanic black folks as opposed to non-Hispanic white, which is usually what you see in the media when they're talking about the overdose epidemic. And one of the things that you're gonna hear me talk about a lot with the machines and one of the challenges of testing is that the relative potency of different materials means that you only need a really small amount to have kind of a big impact. So here, these are or equivalent doses of heroin, fentanyl, and carfentanil. And you can see that the carfentanil one is just absolutely tiny. The other thing to talk about fentanyl, and this is a fentanyl molecule, is that it's really, really easy to make analogs to modify it. So it's easy to go from this one to these are some of the more common fentanyl analogs that are out there and have been identified. Uh, so it's just, it's a, it can be, so one of the technologies we're gonna talk about the fentanyl test strip is limited to a certain number of analogs. And that comes into play when you think about how easy it is to make new analogs, how easy it is to then get around a test that would be able to detect it. Another challenge that comes up with when you're looking at an illicit drug market is a heterogeneous versus a homogeneous mixture. And I also should flag, I, I may have said both of those words wrong, I'm sorry, I mispronounce words like that a lot. Uh, but the basic upshot is you want a mixture where everything is distributed uniformly so that you can better detect things. That's unlikely to happen in a sample of powder that is purchased on the street. The way to make something uniform like that is to dilute it or put it in water and that doesn't allow it to run on some of the machines we have. So we know that we're working around a non-uniformly dis distributed substance, which means that some of the tests have kind of like blind spots because we know that we may or may not be touching the thing we want to. And that leads us to what gets called the chocolate chip cookie conundrum. So if you think about a bag of powder as like a chocolate chip cookie and fentanyl are an active ingredient as the chocolate, if you're blindfolded and you're just taking a tiny part of the cookie you don't really know, you're, you can't be sure that you're hitting the chocolate chip. So if you then are reporting your analysis and you took a sample of the cookie that didn't have the chocolate chip, it's still a chocolate chip cookie, but you're not gonna know that. So that's one of the big sampling issues that we work around as well. Just because we got results on something, if we can't guarantee, so like we didn't stick this in a blender so that we could look at everything the same, then we just have to warn people that we may have missed one of the active ingredients. So now I'm finally getting to the technology. The machines we used, the first one was a Fourier Transform Infrared Spectrometer, an FTIR. This is a picture of what it looks like. And so basically a small sample of powder, typically uh, about the size of a half a grain of rice or a match head gets loaded onto that. You clamp the anvil down and then infrared light is put through the, the sample and then you analyze the spectrum on a a laptop that's attached to the machine. It's not pictured here. So this is the machine in particular. If you put a liquid sample on here, you get H2O as your result. So because of that big limitation with this machine, almost all the samples have to be dry. They have to be powder or something like that. And then this also has a detection threshold of 5%. So it's just going to miss things that are potent and small. So it's going to miss carfentanil and it can miss fentanyl in low concentrations. And that's a really big thing to keep in mind when talking about results from this machine. So this is what the spectrum looks like. So if you were analyzing, you put a sample in, you got this. And so what I have up here is the first screen where it's showing a match to lactose or milk sugar, which is a very common cut. And then 
what I have circled right there is a heroin peak. So one of the other challenges of this is that the software is not going to analyze it for you. So you have a technician who's sitting there and clicking and knows, okay, well, just because lactose is the first hit underneath it, there's something else and can look at this and be able to understand the ways in which substances are stacked up. Something narrow there. The second machine used was a high pressure mass spectrometer, a portable one specifically. So a lot of people think of mass spec the way that they might've seen it in a university lab. And this is not that, this was designed to be used in the field. Um, it looks exactly like it does here. You put a little bit of sample on a swab, which is in the far left corner that goes into the machine. It's heated up, it goes through an ion trap and then it puts out this little result screen. So it, it was designed for uh, police and military. So it has a very alarmist um, interface. So like it, this is the drug hunter mode that you have to use and it gives you these like red warnings that there's fentanyl in there or that there's heroin or whatever it would be. And the other thing to note about this one is the user can't do anything to manipulate the results. So in contrast to the FTIR output where it's a spectrum that you're analyzing this, you either believe that this is the result or that it's not. And then the last and final technology, which most people are probably more familiar with is the fentanyl test strip. Uh, so it's a chromatographic amino assay. You dilute a bit of sample in water, you stick the bottom of the stick in, it sucks up the water and reacts. If there's one line, it's fentanyl. If there's two lines, it's no fentanyl. So it's the opposite of a pregnancy test. And one of the limitations of this technology is, like I said, it, it has a limited panel of analogs. So as new analogs are created, they may or may not trip the strip. It's also been demonstrated that things that aren't fentanyl trip a false positive on this test strip. So diphenhydramine or Benadryl, uh, methamphetamine, other things like that. So the interpretation of these strips, they're great technology because they're easy. Anyone can use them. They have binary output, but knowing the false positives and the times when it isn't correct can make it a little more difficult to take this kind of as an absolute truth in the absence of another test to go along with it. So um, the tests were run on the mobile outreach vans of the Chicago Recovery Alliance. Participants could come on the van. They could either, they could put a little bit of powder on the machines to be run for a test. It would take about five to 10 minutes and they could get their results right there. So. That was all along lead up to what are the results. So of things tested, 282 were sold as dope essentially. Two oxycodone samples were tested and they're at the bottom because they're a little bit um, off the wall. Most of what was sold as dope did not contain heroin. So only 39% of the samples had heroin. Half of them had fentanyl and then 13% had heroin and fentanyl together. Uh, the things I have circled on here are, it says 18% had amphetamine, but that was actually due to the fact that the HPMS machine initially could not identify diphenhydramine. It was mistaking diphenhydramine for amphetamine. Diphenhydramine, which is Benadryl or Dorman, is so commonly cut into dope in Chicago. So pretty much every sample was tripping that amphetamine alarm. They were able to update it. So probably that 18% amphetamine belongs in the diphenhydramine column. And then I've also circled, there was a fair number of samples that did not have an active identified. So heroin or fentanyl couldn't be confirmed. And what that points to is either uh, something very potent that can't, if the machines aren't catching something new that is not in the machine library because the two spectrometers operate off of matching. So if the match isn't in the library, it can't make a match. Or just that it was the sampling issue I talked about earlier where whatever the active was, it didn't get into the thing that went on the machine. The two oxy samples down here, um, they kind of just highlight how small things will escape the machines. So I have listed out the results and it was pretty clear from testing that they had a cut, so inositol or mannitol, paracetamol, and then fentanyl. So the fentanyl test strip was positive for both of them and then one of them actually had a fentanyl hit on the high pressure mass, but fentanyl didn't pop up on the FTIR. So some samples like this, we were able to send in for laboratory testing, and that's where you can see these long lists of a whole bunch of other stuff that were actually in there. So that's, it's a good reminder on the limitations of the field technology, because some of these things like xylosine that were in there, you would have wanted to tell someone on the spot, but the technology that was available wasn't able to catch that. This is just a bigger breakout chart of the cuts. So thinking about what else is in a sample besides the actives, 
And then the things I wanted to highlight here, so the samples that had fentanyl uh, were more likely to have quinine and mannitol. So that was just an interesting thing to note that the quinine possibly was being cut in there so that it would smell and taste like heroin. And then diphenhydramine, it's a huge percentage of all of these, but it seemed to be an even higher percentage in the ones where actives were difficult to identify. Uh, a smaller subset of samples were cocaine and crack cocaine. Uh, the amphetamine is highlighted here just because it was also popping in there as well. The machine just tends to identify things it's struggling to match as amphetamine. And then you can see here that none of the tests were able to identify heroin or fentanyl in cocaine or crack cocaine. And granted, this is a very small subsample, uh, but that was often a concern that people had when they were bringing their samples in. And so the machines, at least when these tests were done and the samples that were tested on them, were not identifying fentanyl in the cocaine or crack cocaine. Oops, and that's, sorry, Susan, I'm done. <laughs> it's your turn. Okay, can everyone see that or? Okay, good, I have, I have at least Victoria nodding at me. So, um, so what does all that mean? It's, it's a lot of incredibly uh, cool technology being brought into the field and used in a completely different context. You know, we, it, when we think about overdose and we think about the things that we're doing to address overdose in the city, it's potentially another fantastic tool, right? The capacity to tell someone what's actually in their drugs so that they can make decisions about how to use that, right? So they can understand what's being put in their body or a variety of other things. Uh, but because this is a new and relatively innovative strategy, actually using these, these machines out in the field and doing this as a service um, with people who use drugs, there really isn't much out there to understand a, whether or not people find this useful, what motivates them to try um, this service, to trust it, to engage with it, um, what do they do with the results that they receive, um, how confident are they about those results, those types of things. And so we did a qualitative study with uh, 20 people who use drugs, who've used the drug checking service, um, a, a purposely variable sample, uh, across sites and demographics to really just try to get a, a preliminary understanding of how useful this service is in their daily lives. And this is a similar methodology to the one that I described in the, in the previous presentation in that these were private interviews. They were interviews conducted in the field, either it, you know in my car or another private space next to the van um, after somebody went through using the drug checking service. Um, we taped those interviews, they were transcribed by a professional service, and then I verified the transcripts listening and reading. Um, and they were coded by multiple coders and we looked for themes. And so I'm just gonna share, again, this is, there's really nothing out there talking about this. So this is very preliminary stuff, but it's starting to give us some of the picture of how people are using a relatively new and innovative service locally. So I wanted to start off thinking, you know, okay, so what are people doing in their, in their daily lives already to try to protect themselves from overdose when they're using? And so there were a variety of things that people actually discussed in these interviews that they're doing, you know, even without the, this idea of drug checking. And so, you know, sort of common strategies people mentioned were not mixing um, not mixing heroin uh, or, or anything, especially people mentioned quite a bit benzodiazepines and alcohol uh, because of the overdose risk. Um, people talked about doing a taste shot, uh, tasting their shot, um, you know, doing a little bit of their shot um, and, and seeing whether or not it felt predictable before using an entire bag or before using their entire quantity that they normally use. They talked about pacing and using things slower, especially if they were kind of uh, suspicious about uh, the content of any particular bag of heroin. 
um, they talked about using clean equipment, not so much from overdose, but for other protections. They talked about telling someone else to have naloxone ready or them having naloxone ready to respond in the event that someone overdoses. They talked a lot about trying to be consistent and, you know, once they found a dealer that they felt a sense of trust with and they thought they knew the product that they were getting going back to that dealer and not varying so much their purchasing patterns. Um, they also talked about how, you know, you, if, you, if you're doing this daily and you're doing it multiple times daily, you have a sense of how your heroin should smell, what it should look like, what it should taste like. And so that, you know, this sense of if something seemed like it was a bit off, maybe people would be a bit more careful in the way that they use that particular bag of drugs. Um, they also talked about if there was new stuff and someone else was introducing it to them, not being the first person to use it and sort of assessing and seeing how it goes. Um, a couple of people mentioned using fentanyl test strips, especially if it was a new dealer that they were getting product from. And so here's an example quote at the bottom. Um, I never die, dive into something that I get, even if I've gotten the same thing from the same person. Um, if I get a new batch, first I'm going to do, and this person referred to it as an allergy test, I'm going to take half a milligram and I'm going to wait a while and see what happens. I'm going to work my way up to the active dose range, compare it against what I know I should be expecting. So this gives you an idea of the types of comments that, uh, that people shared when they talked about how they usually um, prepare and, and safely use. And then when asking about motivations to test, like what, what made you use the drug checking services today? What was interesting to you about that? Um, the first was, you know, very often the person said, well, I really didn't know what it was, but I trust uh, John or I trust Melissa or I trust the person who told me to go to the woman in the back of the van and try it out. And so that established relationship between that participant and the person who's the outreach worker was really helpful in somebody saying, yeah, I'll try this new thing. That said, there were lots of comments from people who either were new to sites or didn't have that same sense of trust um, about the term drug checking. And it was very clear that that's, you know, in many ways could be interpreted as something where people might be policed um, or the type of drug test you might get when you go to drug treatment. And so I'm not sure the terminology was helpful in, in recruiting participants, the, the term drug checking, um, but trust with, you know, a trusted relationship with the person who was recommending it was. The second was, uh, I, well, this was weird. This thing that I used, I knew something was wrong with it. I didn't have the right experience or I had a very odd experience and I really don't think there was heroin in here or I really think there was fentanyl in here. And so I wanted to know whether or not um, this was what I thought it was. And so this is really interesting because I think when the, you know, in the origins of this program, we imagined that people would always be testing a drug before they used it. Like they would test something, they would see what the results were, and then they would make decisions about how they would use it. And in fact, lots of people were testing after. You know, some of that could have been circumstance. They found out they had an empty bag with some residue that they could use for the testing process. But some of it was this absolute desire to see, was this thing that I experienced differently um, really different? And so that, that bad or odd or different experience um, compelled them to be a part. The third motivation was confirmation. So people were just wanting to know, so sort of the opposite of the bad experience. I wanna know that what I purchased as heroin is actually heroin. I want to know that um, I can trust this person that I'm buying from and so on and so forth. So really just looking for that confirmation. And the final sort of theme around motivations to test was this idea of, well, we should all know what we put in our bodies, the informed consumer. So we know what is, you know, we know what's in the food we eat, we read the labels, we can see the ingredients, we understand. Um, we don't have that when there's an illicit market. And so this allows us to be informed consumers in a way that we've not been able to be before.
And so this was a really uh, fun quote to kind of highlight some of this. I love the ability to check what I have in a more concrete way that's less me like doing scientific method, trying to deduce, you know, rule out all the other possibilities of what things can be hard scientific data as opposed to the myths and magical thinking. So some of the responses to results were really interesting. We did see uh, quite a lot of uh, harm reduction modifications. So uh, people talking about, well, if I found that there was fentanyl in this bag, um, I would do one bag instead of several, or I would pace the way that I do it, or I would do the test shot first. So a lot of the same repeat strategies that you heard earlier, but implementing them after finding out that there was something in the bag that they didn't expect to be there. Um, there were definitely discussions of, you know, I, and I think Lydia and I have talked about this, uh, drug checking is very different if you're doing it at a festival and people want to see what's in their ecstasy than it is when you are doing it on a van with people who are uh, dependent on the opioids that they're using every day. They, they're not going to have that same kind of autonomy or choice to say, I'm not going to use this, I'm going to throw it in the trash, because there is that pending withdrawal that might happen and, and some panic around that. And so um, if I am going to use it, um, I might use it a little differently. So, so you see that reflected in the second quote here, not saying you're not going to do it, but knowing what you're doing. Um, and then, so then they talk about the strategy that they might implement knowing uh, that there's now fentanyl in this versus not knowing that there was. We had some sellers, um, some dealers involved in the research as well. Um, uh, one that uh, defined themselves as, uh, as a dealer and others that were selling and sort of just buying for themselves and friends. So not like a um, identification as a dealer, but someone who is purchasing and then um, helping other people around them. So you see uh, those, those efforts to incorporate harm reduction in both of those types of scenarios in the next two quotes. Um, I've added some harm reduction messages for my customers. I don't want anyone, um, I don't want anyone getting hurt buying from me. Um, I always communicate the results people need to know so they can make decisions about how to use it. And then, you know, there were a, a whole host of quest, uh, statements about, I'm not sure much is going to change at all, but it's really important that I know this. Or if I start to see that there's fentanyl in this over and over again, I'm going to understand better how to use this fentanyl in a way that's not uh, going to hurt me. And then quite a few people talked about whether or not the findings from the drug checking was going to shift the way that they purchase, where that they purchase, and whether or not they communicate the findings to the person they purchase from. And often people did not, but there were a few uh, folks who felt like they had the kind of open or trusted relationship with their dealer where they could go back and say, hey, you sold this to me as heroin, this is actually fentanyl. Um, you need to know this. And so that was really mixed in terms of people's willingness to communicate that back. There were often safety concerns about communicating that back. Um, but many people said, well, I wouldn't buy there again. So they would make different purchasing decisions. One interesting unintended effect that um, we've seen in the data was that people are learning um, they are, they're seeming to appreciate and learn the role of fentanyl test strips in a way that wasn't a purposeful part of the program to, to really make sure people were using fentanyl test strips properly and to continue to promote them. But in the process of working with the technician and testing something and, and seeing that proper procedure as, as they're doing that in front of the technician, it really seemed to be something that then helped people commit to the use of fentanyl test strips a bit more uh, later, or be more willing to take fentanyl test strips and actually use them if they don't have access to drug checking. So this was a really nice finding. Um, as Lydia mentioned in her presentation, uh, the machines do have limitations. They all have limitations, and, and that's why there are multiple machines used in, in any one interaction. Um, but also participants were able to articulate what they felt were some of the challenges or needed improvements to the program, and some of those um, improvements were about the technology. 
So the first was that, um, you know, noticing the machines can only test for stuff that's already in their library. And people were really frustrated about things. We had one or two people talk about LSD um, or liquids, um, psilocybin, um, though that wasn't the bulk of the participants in this study by any means. Um, quite a few people talked about the frustration of not being able to identify benzodiazepines, which are uh, definitely a uh, an overdose risk if combined with an opioid. Um, the the risk, you know, the sort of limits around detecting all of the different analogs uh, with fentanyl. Um, and then somebody noting that one machine seemed really frustrating for the amount of strips that you go through and the sort of consumer incentive on the part of the person selling the machine and how it would be really, um, <laughs> it really would be better if you weren't having to use so many materials um, to test something. And thinking about service implications, the things that people said that were really important were, um, you know, the fact that this isn't as available as it should be. And it isn't as available to people who need to be um, in hidden populations who don't feel safe accessing services like this. And although our law shifted and it is legal for people to bring residue and to test it in the program, um, there's still the very real reality that people feel regular harassment by the police and that this is a continual risk and that they may not feel safe coming and accessing this service. Um, there was frustration around not having the machines in every outreach uh, vehicle at every site and not having it there every day. And so the need for expanding that is definitely something people talked about. And people also talked about, um, you know, what do we do about this? Like, how do you give us information about this? Like, can you give us a map? Can you give us uh, information about where not to buy? But at the same time, you want to be really careful about the information that you give because you don't want retaliation if, if you're giving information that is um, potentially harmful to someone's drug sales. And so there was definitely this sense of um, how do we make this maximally helpful uh, to us as, cons as consumers, as participants of this service, um, while also making sure that everybody is protected and, and the information that's given um, is given and everybody's able to stay safe with that. I want to uh, definitely acknowledge um, our incredible partners and funders in this CDC Foundation, um, CDPH and IDPH, as well as um, partners in confirmatory drug checking and partners who have been instrumental in helping, um, not me because I don't do the checking, it's all Lydia and she's the brains behind that, but <laughs> helping us uh, determine um, you know, how to interpret things that are difficult to interpret who've been doing uh, some of these machines longer. And so those partners are listed as well. Um, and uh, questions. Folks have the option of either submitting questions via chat or you're welcome to unmute yourself and start your video and just ask questions of the group. But thank you very much to Suzanne and to Lydia for that presentation and then to Suzanne also for the previous one. Maybe I missed this at the beginning. When did the drug checking project begin? Do you want to talk about the month that you started doing checking as opposed to uh, origin, me talking about origins of thought? <laughs> yeah, no, sorry, that's a good point. It wasn't yeah. a good at all. Yeah. Um, it, the machines arrived in February of 2019 and it took about two months to really get them ready to go on the van, so April 2019. And how do you communicate that to the folks you're aiming to serve? Just because they already have trust in your organization and they know the van when it's out, 
Yeah, I, I think that's the answer. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's it's an interesting question too, because I think every site feels very different in the relationship that wh whatever outreach worker kind of runs that site with the, the community. And also that things are very different now because people aren't actually getting on the van because of the pandemic. And so that has kind of um, shifted the way all of the services are delivered. Um, but people are still dropping bag, like baggies of residue to be tested and things that we can then test and give results. But it is it is not um, as easy to do in current you know, conditions than it used to be. Um, but yeah, I think a lot of, you know, sort of proactive discussion by not just outreach workers, but also, wouldn't you say, Lydia, participants? Because many were talking in the interviews about, I've told people, and this is what I tell them, like, you should know what's in that bag. And it, they're, you know, this is not a police thing. You're not going to like go in there, it's drug checking and something bad is going to happen. You're actually going to go in and there's a nice uh, person there who's going to help you understand what you have so you can be safer. So it's it's kind of nice. I think the word of mouth thing is really powerful. It was one of the themes I didn't talk about, but that was there. It's such awesome work. I, I'm not in this space regularly, and it was a really cool project to hear about. It's, it is cool. I mean, it's still really hard, I think, for us to figure out how you would scale it, how you would make it bigger, because the technology has a really steep learning curve, and the machines are subject to environmental conditions as well. And so when you start thinking about learning curves and, and you know, optimal conditions to run the machines and, um, and how you make that work in an outreach vehicle that already has you know, 10 other things that people might do. It's not probably the easiest thing to scale up to. And they're also expensive. We didn't mention that, but they're, the machines are expensive. <laughs> so there's a cost element, definitely. Do any of your colleagues from across the country, um, are they doing similar work or are you gonna be able to compare your research to anything else that's going on? Lydia, you want to talk about that? Who's yes. doing what? So pretty much uh, at the FTIR and the fentanyl test strips have been in use in Vancouver with a couple different organizations for about two years. So it's very easy for us to compare those results with them. And they have a pretty different market. And then Boston, an organization there now has both machines. But for the most of the duration of what we reported on, they only had the high pressure mass machine. So we didn't have anyone where we could do a direct comparison of everything, but we had two groups we could compare pieces to. It's, it's still so new, right? I think as people start to get excited and there's more talk about it at conferences and there are maybe a few more papers that people read about it, um, folks might write grants and start to, there's a national group that talks you know, and sort of tries to share resources and and to help answer questions for people who are interested. So I think it, it would be really nice. In my mind, it's this was very preliminary research, both the quantitative research and the qualitative research. It's still new, it's still uh, emerging, and it's an exciting additional tool potentially, but 